David Politis, of course, is the researcher, author, and investigator. He started all this with his book, Missing 411, which dealt with people disappearing in our public park systems. They merely vanished. David, welcome. I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> Thanks, George. It's great to be here. What was it about this subject that got you first involved in investigating it? Years ago, uh, I was doing some peripheral research in a national park. I noticed a couple of park rangers following me around, which isn't that unusual. Yeah. And went back to my uh, location off the park site, and these guys showed up independently. And they said they knew of me, and they had been looking into missing people at the various parks that they had worked at. Okay. And they realized that on the front end, when somebody goes missing, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of investigation. And then after about seven or eight days, everything stops. And when they tried to find out what happened to the victim and get more information, they were stymied and they said something didn't feel right. Yeah. And then subsequent to the disappearance, the follow-up investigation by special agents of the Park Service really never happened. In your opinion, David, how many people are missing just from the park systems alone? Well, that's, that's tough because they won't tell us. And we don't know how far back to go, right? We it, 1700s, 1800s? Well, it, just in our research, I have cases going back. Um, there's nine countries that we've documented these incidents in All right. that fit this profile. Same profile. And uh, in those nine countries, we have one case that goes all the way back to 1768 in France. Huh. If you had to guess, though, speculate on how many total people we're talking about disappearing. So we've documented right now in our books about 1,100. 1,100 people. Now you highlighted in the film a lot of missing children cases. Tell me about that, why you highlighted on that. So we could have, we could have gone many gamuts with this. We could have right. done it about hunters, hikers, adults, females. We chose to do children for one reason. It, if I sit down with you and I said, well, person disappeared at point A and he was found five miles away and 2,000 feet uphill. Well, somebody like you and I, not a big deal. But a two-year-old child, uh -uh. I don't think so. And it, it's for that reason we focused on children. They're, they really can't go that far in the wilderness. And when they set up their parameters to search, they're usually searching within those parameters where 95% of the kids are found. Yeah. And in those incidents, uh, just go back to the Crater Lake incident, they kept going further and further and further out. They bring canines in, the canines can't bring up a scent. All of a sudden the weather changes. Uh, they bring in professional trackers. None of these people can find a little child. It's a- What is going on? Well, that's why I'm here. I hope you're, you were gonna tell me, George. You have access to so many different people that I thought someone in this world would come in and say, this is the answer. Well, you know, I come from the school of, you know, look at something natural first, you know, murders, disappearances, accidents. But once that's all weighed off, and you say that's most of them are weighed off, then you come to the very unusual, the strange, the mystical. And is there anything in your research, David, that showed you about folklore? I know you talked about a case in the 1700s but about folklore about this happening. Did Native Americans talk about stuff like this or anything like that, do you know? Great, great idea and a great topic. Uh, in one of the books I wrote about Iceland and they have folklore of people or fairies living in boulders. And do you know in Iceland, they won't move a boulder to make a road. They'll t put the road around, around the, the boulder. boulder. They don't want to disturb their habitat. That's right. right. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I've written about boulders having the association of missing people and boulder fields. Um, and then in my latest book that, that we're talking about today, I talk about granite. Well, there's a giant mound of granite in Texas. Mm -hmm. And there's a story from the late 1800s about a priest being chased. And the priest said that he ran on top of this giant piece of solid and it engulfed him and took him. And he said he walked around inside this for days and then it spit him out. Whoa. And I thought, wow, priests don't usually fabricate. No. So, or hallucinate. Yeah. So what happened there? But I thought the association of the granite, it's swallowing him and then spitting him out days later. Strange. 
How much do we not know about this planet and this universe? Oh, we, we know far less than what we think we know. I, there's so much about the world and, and just the people I've talked to in the last seven years and the access. I mean, it, it's a constant eye-opening experience to me. So McGrogan was an ER doctor, emergency room doctor, and super sharp guy, Yeah, marathon runner. Uh, he went with some other physicians and they were right up here, up Highway 70, right across from Vail Resort. And there's a very well-marked trail that goes up to this ice hut where they were gonna spend the night. And McGrogan being in excellent shape, his group stopped and he says, hey, I'm not tired. I'm gonna just keep gonna going. Keep going yeah. So he keeps going and they go to their next stop. He's not there. And they think, well, maybe he just kept going. So they went up, eventually they reached the hut. He's not there and they're concerned. This guy did everything right, George. He had backup batteries. He had backup systems. Mm -hmm. He had avalanche detection. He had everything that I would have had. Maybe if I a was, weapon? Uh, I don't think Who he, knows? I don't think he did. But, yeah. you know, what predators are out in the middle of winter in Colorado? Yeah. On this, there, There's nothing. There's the bears are hibernating, the mountain lions. You would find the scene. Long story short, he disappears. Giant search. Giant search. They bring in helicopters. They bring in planes. They bring in searchers. So you got to remember, he's on a snow trail. So do they find some of that trail he's on? Here's the, here's the scenario. If you're on that trail, and if you deviated off the trail, there would be marks. There would be marks of your, of your snowboard. Right. Well, they, filed, they followed every mark, and every mark turned around and came back. Now, the location where McGrogan was on this trail, and the location he was eventually found, six miles to the east, there's nothing but giant hills and rolling snow. So if he would have traveled from point A to point B, it would have looked like a giant snow plow You'd going through it. that mountain and out helicopters and everyone would have seen him. Yeah. But the more amazing thing is uh, anywhere along that point, you could see Vail Resort, you could get out your cell phone, you could call for help. Bizarre. No marks, no call. So they decided to search all the way to this one valley six miles mm -hmm. away. And they went up the valley, didn't find anything. Nothing. They call off the search. Within a day later, some other people were up this valley, and they find his body at the bottom. Snow skis are still on his back. He's wearing a helmet. His helmet is caved in, and he died from blunt force trauma to the head. Now, that's all that the story tells you. And that's all the public knows from the public description of the news accounts. So I thought, this isn't right. So I request from Eagle County a copy of the coroner's report mm -hmm. and the search and rescue report. And I thought, wow, this is strange. How come the news never said that he's found not wearing boots? Yeah. Why would he take his boots off? That makes no sense. When you got into this, there must have been one or two case studies that first cropped up that got you to say, hey, there's something weird here. I'm going to study this. How'd that happen for you? Well, originally, it, we got a, I got a notification from a national park ranger that uh, he had worked at a series of national parks, and they had an unusual amount of disappearances, and the people had disappeared in unusual places that really didn't make a lot of sense to this person. And over the years, they tried to do a little research and figure out what happened, and they got stymied. And the more they looked into it, in, into their internal system, he got concerned that there wasn't enough being done and eventually ended up uh, contacting me when I was at a park doing some peripheral research. And we started to look into disappearances in the U.S. National Park System. Probably the first case that brought my interest was a case of Stacy Eros that disappeared in Yosemite. Yeah. Uh, a 14-year-old girl that was on a, a pack train ride into Sunrise Lakes into the High Sierra area of Yosemite. Her and her dad stopped at a series of cabins uh, she got off her horse, freshened up, and her and a 70-year-old man named Stuart went and took a short walk off to this bluff, and she brought her camera, and they were going to just take pictures. Mm -hmm. The trail hand saw them walk over there, and she walked away from Stuart and told Stuart she was going to walk down to a lake to take some pictures. And the trail hand and Stuart saw her walk down there, and that was the last time she was ever seen. Subsequent search found the lens cap to her camera right inside the tree line of that area. But the reality is, is they never found a trace of her after that. 
I filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests against the Park Service to get documents. Mm -hmm. And I have received documents before from the Park Service on other missing persons cases. I got a call from their attorney asking me why I wanted the case. And then they asked me what I was going to do with it. And huh. finally, a special agent from the Park Service, a guy named you, told me I would never get that case. Are these cases, David, all around the country or primarily in North America? Originally, we focused on just the United States. And slowly, as the word got out what we were doing, we started to get contacted from people from around the world. And initially, it came out of Canada that there were these additional cases. And then the Canadian National Park System seems to fall into the same category as the U.S. National Park System, as far as the number of disappearances. To date, in North America, we've established 52 clusters of missing people in national parks and national forests throughout North America. Wow. The biggest cluster in the world of missing people, Yosemite National Park. Are these disappearances also happening in cities where you don't have parks? So to, to this point, we established a profile that, that is based upon hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of disappearances and thousands of reports that we've read about missing people. So this profiling, it's a specific point we're looking for. Namely, canines that are brought in can't find a scent. Uh, they disappear and there's nothing heard. There's, there's nothing seen. There's no abduction scenario. Footprints, nothing. Nothing. Uh, the people, a lot of times, are walking with friends or parents and they're either first in line or they're last in line when they disappear. And those people Whoa. don't hear or see anything either. You turn around and they're gone. Exactly. One of the uh, specific scenarios that we get asked is that, well, maybe it's an animal attack. So in the search and rescue reports, they bring in trackers, they bring pr professional people in. In each one of those cases, it's completely absolved that there isn't an animal attack. Um, but one thing that people do say is that uh, in conjunction with these disappearances, immediately after or right after part of that profile is that there's bad weather associated with this, meaning in many of these cases, sometimes it rains inches and inches or snows feet hmm. and feet and days right afterwards. Kind of wipes out the scene, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And uh, so aliens, alien abduction, that's, that's a really common one. Another one that I've heard a lot from Europe and uh, Iceland is fairies. Fairies. Uh, fairies and little people. Uh-huh. And... Uh, I've actually written about that in some of my books because the folklore and mythology that surrounds it talks about them abducting people. Yes, that's right. So Ancient folklore. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, another one is that uh, there's gods, and the gods at times take people for their own will. Mm -hmm. And part of that taking of them is that if they don't fit the eventual needs of those gods, they're replaced back on earth, and those are the ones we find deceased. I've heard that probably 200 times. The other one that you know a, a, a lot of people may think is, is true is that there's a group of serial killers out there in the woods. Correct. To me, that is the least likely of every scenario, not that I'm, I'm categorizing anything, but the reason being is that in these searches, they bring in professional trackers. Part of that professional tracking ability is tracking somebody through the woods. And some of the people they use are Navajo trackers, military trackers, uh, professional private trackers in conjunction with canines. And nothing. Nothing. They don't find tracks leaving huh. the scene. They don't find a sense. So my idea, or, or the idea that people promote that it's a serial killer in the woods, there's a lot of, a lot of things that go with that. And mainly, if there was a serial killer in the woods, then they'd have to carry that body for miles. When they track, do they get to a certain point and it just ends? Sometimes it ends immediately and sometimes they do get to that point and the scent just stops. A lot of times some of the best canine trackers in the world have said that they'll bring the dog to the scene and the dog will walk in a circle, lay down and doesn't want to track. He's scared? Well, the description from some of the searchers is that they can't tell if the dog is uninterested or there is no search. Yeah. So. What about Bigfoot? 
That's another scenario that's been brought up hundreds and hundreds of times. And the issue with that one is the same with the others in that there's no tracks. Right. And if you were going to carry somebody, drag somebody, I think you would hear something on the front end. You would think. Of a, something unusual. What about a portal, another dimension, some kind of... God knows what is going on in this planet, this universe, and that these people just accidentally walk right through it, and they're gone, and they can't get back. Well, in, in all of the scenarios, in what's been explained to me by other experts that have been on your show, to me, that one, if it exists, would be the one that fit every scenario that we've explained in the book. Not that I'm saying that is it. I'm just saying that the scenario the experts lay out seems to be the one that fits the most criteria. As an example, there was a, uh, there was a hunter in Colorado that contacted me a couple years ago, and he was hunting for elk at about 10 or 11,000 feet up in northern Colorado. And he said he was walking on a plain where the grass was maybe four feet high, three mm -hmm. or four feet, and he heard something coming towards him, and he couldn't really identify it. And he kept walking. He got on a trail, and he kept hearing a loud hum. And he started to slow down on the trail. And he said in front of him, it became real blurry. Whoa. So he slowed down even more. Like an opening. Something. Yeah. He, yeah. he says it, it was almost like you were looking through glasses that weren't yours, and it was just strange looking. And he said he almost walked up to it, and it looked like a plate of glass. And he stuck his foot through, and he, part of his foot disappeared. And he said, I put my, brought my foot back, and I turned around, and I ran. That's the first time I've heard that, Yeah, but I suppose what would happen to you if you had your head down, you weren't paying attention. I don't know. That's a good point. Lindsay Page, Eloise Lindsay Page. That is a, one of the more unusual stories along the Appalachian Trail in South Carolina. She was in Table Rock State Park. And uh, I've written a lot about the Appalachian Trail. There's a lot of really unusual things that have happened there and a lot of strange disappearances all along there. She was an older lady. Uh, I think she was in her early 20s, going to do a hike of 43 miles. And uh, she was well prepared, lots of experience. She was going to get picked up, I think, seven to eight days after her drop-off point. Well, she wasn't there for the pickup point. Her story is, is that about three days into it, there were a series of men that were following her and harassing her on the trail. Hmm. Now, when you just take it at that point, hey, maybe it's happened. Maybe. This went on for days. And uh, eventually, 14, 18 days, a hunter finds her cowering in the woods. Cowering. She's alive. Alive. They bring her out, and she tells this story that these men followed her, harassed her, she dumped her backpack, she got rid of everything, um, and then she was eventually went to the hospital. The interesting part of the story to me is, isn't what she said, because she never explained exactly what she saw, but when her mom was interviewed, her mom said, I'm not sure what really happened to my daughter in the woods, and I don't really know for sure what my daughter saw in the woods. Huh. Like she was not accepting the story of the men? Or her, her daughter obviously wasn't comfortable in telling the whole story. But that scenario of the men along the Appalachian Trail, there's been many disappearances there over the years where people are just never found. Uh, there's a woman named Geraldine Larguet that was in Maine, that was walking the entire uh, Appalachian Trail, and every day or every two days her husband would resupply her. She was 66 years old, I think, maybe maybe a little older. Phenomenal shape. Jeez. She'd call her husband all the time. One day didn't call. Massive search. Maine Warden Service threw everything at that search, and even the wardens said they couldn't believe they didn't find anything of her. Still never been found. That, that, that was a real troubling one. The other real troubling one occurred in 19, uh, in the 60s, uh, Dennis Martin, him, his dad, his grandpa. Little kid again? Uh, yeah, six years old. Yeah. And, uh, Something about little kids. Little kids. And uh, they were on Spence Field in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And uh, they, uh, f there's a lot of strange parts to this story. And as they were camped in this area, 
a family walks up to them and introduces themselves and says, hey, can our kids play together? He says, sure, that'd be great. Yeah. And they, he reaches out and shakes Mr. Martin's hand and goes, um, our names are the Martins too. Huh. Now that's, just, that's pretty, what would be the odds? Odds are high. Uh, okay. Got so, a kid, your name's Martin. It's like a doppelganger or something. You yeah. Know? And so Mr. Martin says that he sees Dennis, they start playing hide and seek. Sees Dennis go behind a tree just a few feet off the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. They play hide and seek for 50 seconds. Nothing, everyone's supposed to come out. Dennis doesn't come out. And Mr. Martin said, I knew Dave. Something was wrong. I ran right to the tree. Dennis wasn't there. Well, Mr. Martin was a long distance runner. He ran for two miles nonstop down the All Appalachian the Trail. Yeah. Just straight down the trail. Because yeah. he figured that's the only that's place. That's the only way you're going to go, right? Right. So comes back. His dad runs down, gets rangers. This is one of those scenarios where it started at about 4.30 that afternoon. It started to rain. Rain nonstop for two weeks. Now, during that two-week period, the Park Service threw everything at it. They're, they not only threw everything they could at it, but they also called in the Green Berets, reportedly. Wow, that's heavy hitting. I get a case file. It's about two inches thick on this incident from the, from the Park Service. Yeah. One of the times they complied. And in that report, it never says anywhere, anywhere in any of those reports, who called the Park Service or who called the Green Berets. Now, Dwight McCarter was the head tracker for the Park Service when he retired in that region. And I asked Dwight, I said, so Dwight, who called him? He says, I don't know, Dave. And I said, so was there anything unusual? Oh, yeah. He says, when the, par when the Green Berets came in, they set up a camp away from everybody else. They set up their own communication system. They supposedly had never been in the park. Mm -hmm. And they said the Park Service offered to partner a few of them with one of theirs because they knew the park. Sure. Green Berets said, no, we, we'll work alone. They'll do a little alone. And Dwight said that they never talked to him. They never dealt with them. They were there a week. They flew in in helicopters, left in helicopters. No one ever took responsibility of who called them. Wow. Now, as this is going on, there's a family that enters the park, and their last name is the Key family, K-E-Y. Now, what's interesting about that is that this is what I think the key to the case. They ask a ranger where they could go to see Bear. The ranger sends them to this area called Rowan's Creek in the park. It's about two or three miles from Spence Meadows, where the Martin family was at, and it's downhill. They go into the Rowan's Creek area, they walk in on this rural trail, and they kind of get split up a little bit, and a dad and his sons are ahead. And as they're walking up, they hear this, in their words, sickening loud scream. Finally, we hear a sound from something. Correct. Now, this is hours after Dennis disappeared, but they didn't know anything happened. Yeah. And their 12-year-old boy looks up on the hill, and he says, Dad, look at that. Uh, a bear is running around on the hill. Mr. Key looks up on the hill and says, Son, that's not a bear. That's a man. And he says, Really? And, and they didn't get a good view huh. of it because it kept hiding behind trees. So they watch it for a little bit, and they, they, don't, they never see a bear, so they ended up going back. They didn't know anything happened that day. They leave, they go home, and the next day in the Knoxville Times, headlines is, this boy disappears. Boy. Yeah. They think they should contact the park. They do. And by this time, an FBI agent is on scene monitoring the search, but not participating, according to them. He's monitoring. So the FBI and an investigator from the Park Service take the call. The Key family says, hey, we'll come to the park and show you exactly where we were at when we saw it, which as a former investigator, that's exactly what I'd want. Right. I want to see their perspective. Right. Well, what happened was is that they told them, don't come to the park, we'll meet you. Well, Mr. Martin had an agreement with all the investigators that anything they heard, he would immediately know. He was never told about this for weeks later until a reporter from the Knoxville Times came to him and said, do you know about this? Huh. He said he blew his lid. He should have. But the FBI told the Key family, hey, it's impossible, it's not related. He told the FBI agent, told the press, it's not related, don't worry about it. Well, the press didn't believe it. So they go to Dwight McCarter, the tracker. 
And since the FBI agent said, it's impossible, the timing doesn't work, McCarter told Mr. Uh, Martin, let's make the walk together. Let's see how far we could go. He, McCarter proved it could be, it could happen. The timing could work. Yeah. Well, myself and another investigator went to Knoxville, went right to Mr. Martin's house, knocked on the door and met the man. And I explained who I was, and I explained, Mr. Martin, there's probably nobody else you know of that knows as much about your son's disappearance as you and me. Yep. And I just want to ask a little bit of your time. And I could see his wife in the next room, and he said, Dave, we spent a lifetime trying to get this behind us. I agreed. I wouldn't talk to anybody else about it because it's caused me nothing but grief. I said, give me 15 minutes, please. I came all the way from California for yep. this. He says, okay. He steps outside. George, in all my career, I don't know if I've had a tougher conversation with anybody. He said that there's so much about the story that the press won't talk about. And he said, Dave, you know, thank you for taking the time to understand. But I can't tell you how much I'm disturbed by the Park Service and the newspaper and the press not telling the truth and trying to hide the truth from me. And he said that... He said, the part about the Key family, and I said, yeah. And he says, do you know what they never would put in the paper and they would never put in a report? And I said, what's that? You know what they saw on the hill? I said, yeah. It was carrying something on its shoulder. He said, I talked to the Key family. The newspapers wouldn't put that in the newspaper. And he goes, did you find that in any Park Service report? I said, there was nothing it was, about that. It was the little boy on the shoulders of whatever that was. Well, and, and in that... There's nothing in that two inches of document about the key family observation. That's amazing. And I asked him, what else is there I should know about this case? This is after 15, 20 minutes. And Mr. Martin said, well, do you know that FBI agent that was on the scene? I said, yeah, he was on the scene for all the disappearances in Smoky Mountain National Park and the other nine disappearances I documented in the area. He was that agent. He goes, do you know what happened to him? I said, no. He says he committed suicide. Oh, my God. And about a month later, we confirmed he committed suicide. What an unbelievable story. David, you keep doing what you're doing, all right? Because somebody's got to watch this story. Thank you so much for being on my The pleasure, Unbelievable. George. Thank you. These stories are probably the scariest I have ever heard in my 46 years of broadcasting, uncovered by a man who will not give up until he gets these answers. David Politis. I'm George Norrie, and this is Beyond Belief.